sets out the annual report for uh, this council um, for that period um, for 2019, ending the 1st of March. The summary is set out on page 15. That gives you a bit of more detail. I think last time we brought this last year, I think some members felt that it would be helpful with a bit more detail in terms of the range of complaints and what have been um, brought uh, to the Ombudsman. So um, the table at 4.21 is, is just that, that's to give a bit more detail. The detailed report from the Ombudsman and the annual letter starts on page 17 of the agenda and you'll see there's a, 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 a table which is set out on pages 20 and 21, that's what we normally receive from the Ombudsman and you'll see there that in the table there were 11 decisions made uh, in connection with complaints as the Ombudsman of which one was upheld. Um, details of that are given on page 15. It's the, the last item at the bottom of the table on page 15, uh, which is in connection with uh, a benefits case. Uh, and you'll see there that uh, I think by the time the Ombudsman had come to a conclusion on that matter, the council had already rectified the issue. Uh, so no further action was actually necessary as a result. Um, the only other thing to say um, before I throw it over to members for questions is um, that obviously. There is this curious tendency on the part of the Ombudsman uh, to uh, report on their uphold rate. Uh, and you'll see that their report, and if you look at the website, you'll see that they have a 100% um, uphold rate against this council. And that's because they uphold, um, uh, they had one complaint that they actually investigated and they upheld it. So uh, all it looks uh, more interesting than uh, if they'd investigated four and then upheld one, in which case we'd have had it to a 5% uphold rate, but as it is, we're about 100%. Um, I think the um, lies, damn lies, and statistics immediately springs to mind. Of course, with the external in the room, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> um, the, uh, other than that, the report is just for noting, but if members have questions that they wish to raise, then I or my colleagues will be able to say colleagues. Any colleague will be able to <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for that. Um, I did go on, as I always do, and have a look on the hyperlinks that are in these letters from the Ombudsman, uh, just to check that their data reflects what our understanding is, and it does. Uh, I don't know if any other member did, and I also saw the anomalous point you referred to, that there's a 100% uphold rate. I was looking on their website as well for some kind of context 
that might help inform the, the, the committee. Uh, and on average, 43% of the complaints that the Ombudsman investigates it upheld, it, it are upheld by the Ombudsman. But as, as Director Richardson pointed out, given we only had one complaint, it, it's not a meaning, statistically meaningful uh, sample, so we can't really draw any conclusions from that. Um, I think when we talked about this, and, and uh, Philip said you know, at the start, um, the committee had asked for some more details on this. I think something, and I can't remember, and, and you can uh, obviously uh, advise as chair, um, we also said that we wanted to look at complaints in general in more detail, and I'm just trying to remember if that got added to the work programme or not. I, I, I sorry, Chair, if I can answer. I think that may well be going to the internal OSP because they review right. the complaint procedures. So I think that's something that the internal OSP are looking at, and there is a report I think going on that. Uh, I think it's the next meeting. Thank you. <coughs> Any further member wish to ask a question or speak? No. Therefore, then, can I ask at 2.1 that the, the report be noted? Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Moving over to agenda item 7. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, first quarter report for Treasury Management for 1920. Um, no surprises and changes have had the data being presented, so I'm not going to elaborate too much. Um, only things I do want to highlight um, Section 4, the economic outlook. The interest rate forecast is as has been provided by Link, our Treasury Advisors, um, but with a significant health warning underneath at 4.2 that if we do end up with a no deal Brexit and a bit of a disrupted exit from the EU, that we could see interest rates slashed by 0.5%, which will seriously impact our investment interest going forward, but also borrowing rates as well. Um, 5.4 shows our position as at the end of June compared to the end of the last financial year. Our investments are at 42 million compared to 36 million at the end of March. That's not unusual. That is in line with the same position uh, last financial year. Um, that 42 million does represent the total investments held and it's made up from a number of resources which includes our capital receipts, grants and contributions from external bodies, uh, general fund balances, HRA balances, etc. Um, so even though we're seeing our investment balances going up to 42 million and at, at some points they do hit 45, 48 million, that's not cash available to spend to support day to day services. We invest it to generate an investment return to help the general fund position. Moving on further on into section 5.17, which is our average balances for the first quarter of the year in comparison to the, the fourth financial year last year. Uh, the good news is our investment returns are averaging 1.15 for the first quarter, which is significantly ahead of our benchmark, which is three month and six month investment rates. Um, the Treasury team have been making some strategic investments looking at six month deposits and 12 month deposits just in case we do see investment rates drop, so it's locking in now before we do see a downturn. And the property fund over the page at 520 is still seeing strong performance. Over the first quarter it was generating returns on average of 4%. Um, as we'd said previously, by the time the five year mitigation comes out, any change in capital growth or loss could potentially hit general fund balances, but as we get closer to that uh, five year mitigation, We'll continue with lobbying central government and SIPFA to see if we can either extend that mitigation or they can overturn it and offer a permanent statutory override. We'll be keeping an eye on the uh, property fund um, just to see what happens post Brexit if it's going to have a serious impact on the capital growth or any losses that we see there. But we're not expecting to see any substantial change in yield because that's based on their actual rental income that they're getting from the assets that they're letting. Over the page on 5.26, the table there shows that there's been quite a lot of activity in investments taken in the first quarter, and it just shows that we've done a lot of one year and six months, as I said, just to try and lock in at these 1%, one and a quarter percent rates, um, just, just in case we do see a downturn. We do have sufficient cash liquidity to manage our day-to-day -day expenditure anyway, so we're not placing ourselves at risk that we're going to have any liquidity issues. Uh, 5.28, our capital financing requirements. We are underborrowed at the moment by £9 million and it's forecast to be £12 million at the end of the year as it stands at the moment. Interest rates on borrowing have dropped significantly over the last few days. So I am going to be looking at this position to see if we are in a time where we do need to externalise some of our borrowing. 
as an example, 50 year money is getting close to 1.6 to borrow at, which is extremely low. So, but it's a case of trying to catch a falling knife, at what point do I grab it? Um, the rest of the report just shows our revenue position and our treasury and prudential indicators. There's nothing adverse to report. Our forecasts are at the moment in line with budget expectations, but the next two months will be key once we know what's happened post um, 31st of October and what happens with the markets and the ongoing uncertainty that we're currently experiencing. I'm happy to take any questions from the members. Any member have any questions? I wish to raise. Okay. That's our restricted issue. Therefore, we move to um, back to page 22, where we have a recommendation that we know the report. Is that agreed? As uh, the Chair has already said, I'll introduce Phil Jones, who's here as a representative from uh, Grant Thornton, on behalf of Grant Paston, who unfortunately can't make it. Um, the annual audit letter is a regulatory requirement that our auditors have to present this to the committee um, upon conclusion of uh, our financial statements. The audit findings report, which you, which you uh, considered as part of the annual statement of accounts, is effectively replicated in here, and it's just, it's just confirming what you've already received, but um, whether Phil wants to elaborate or take any questions? Yeah, Craig, I'll just say uh, just a few words, because you, you have already substantially heard all of this, so, uh, but just to give you the, I mean, the good news is you clean opinion on the accounts, a clean opinion on the value fund and the arrangements. Um, the, the one aspect that we uh, still held over is the certificate, because we're still cons uh, currently considering an objection. And when we have objections, we can't close the audit for them because that's one of our duties, which uh, is not yet complete. Uh, the grants were where we certify uh, expenditures such as housing ben benefit grant on behalf of the government. That work is ongoing, and we hope to complete uh, the housing benefit which work by the 30th of November. Uh, I should have said that was, I was talking to page 43, and I'm probably only going to talk to the summary bits. Um, Perhaps the other thing to, to mention is that I think Grant's view and the team's view was that the working papers were in good order and that's, that's always good to hear on these occasions because that makes not only your life easier but ours as well in terms of being able to ensure that the numbers are right in the accounts. The only point we, we were raising on page 44 is a point we raised last year which, which, didn't, which didn't impact on the quality of accounts still but that's, that's like around staffing levels within the finance department and I know that's something that Craig and his team I'm looking at this week. I think it's something that I thought was worth raising again. Yeah. And I think that's probably all of the points that I'd want to raise again, because most of the other points here um, have already been covered with you. The financial position looks pretty reasonable based upon where we are, but we, we, we're noting on page 50 that as you go further ahead, when the uncertainty starts to move around some of the major funding sources, particularly around their funding review, earnings reduction act and various other aspects of the earnings bonus, that, that, that will call all, all councils to have to reassess where they are. And we're, and yet, and we're also saying at the bottom of page 50 that um, you know, you're keeping a very close look high on the reserves and balances, which is, which, is, which is good as well. But your current levels of reserves and balances are reasonably, um, reasonably comfortable. So I think they're probably the only points want to bring out really from the letter. You've seen all this before, but happy to answer any questions. Anyone have any uh, points they wish to raise, Councillor? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, you, you see you're looking at the, you, you can't give us the certificate because you're still looking at the the appeal or whatever. The, the objection. Uh, the objection, sorry. Yeah. Is this the same one that we were told about yes. a couple of months ago? How much longer is that work going to take to, to I think. Through? I think Grant hopes to be able to complete that within a reasonable period of time. It's it's um, it's been a while. So some of the, yeah, it has in all honesty. I mean, some of these things can be trickier and more long-winded than, than you would ideally hope. But I, I'm, I'm so, I know that his intention to try and complete that piece of work. 
what I can do is... Uh, We've got a timeline of all part. What I can do on behalf of the committee, I will email Grant Patterson and mm -hmm. ask him for an update and let the, uh, the committee know if that's okay. With if, the if, if it will be possible for you to just give us an indication of you know the range of outcomes, will it materially yeah. impact on any of this? The objection, it won't affect any of the outcomes on the accounts. Right. Um, the figures were audited and an unqualified opinion was given on the accounts. It was, I think this outstanding objection was primarily related to car parks, the car park income. Um, so it's literally just a case of uh, closing those those off. So and I'll, they will be no more than a foot, no, whatever the outcome Yes. Is. Right, okay, so if you could yeah, I'll give us that I'll reassurance. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So we have to work separately. Right, um, we move to item nine, which is the exclusion of the public and press, recommended that under section 100A bracket 4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public and press be excluded, thank you, Phil, thank you. Thank you. Be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following items. It is it being likely that there would be disclosure of exempt information of the description specified in paragraph one of part one of schedule twelve A to the Act. So if we could switch off the recording, uh, please. Would you take a vote on that, Chair? All those in favour of moving to the uh, Confidential report, please show. Everyone happy to do that? Thank you. 